seems. Um, but Shelley has told Michael that she's being persecuted by the Phoenician, this man who has a camera that can steal memories. And she's warned Michael, you know, don't let him take a picture of you. And gradually, Michael comes to believe that, in fact, the Phoenician is a real man and Shelley is in genuine danger from him. So, on a dark and stormy night, where would horror stories be without those? Um, Shelley's husband is dragged away by a fire at his place of work, and he asks Michael to go look after her. And instantly, Michael begins to suspect that the fire is arson and that the Phoenician is getting ready to make his final strike. And so he wants to protect her. He has one thing standing in his way, which is overwhelming cowardice. Um, and and so, so he's worked out a plan, and his plan is to go to her house but not to enter. He'll just walk around the house and look through the windows and make sure she's alone. And when he's sure it's safe, he'll go inside and he'll get a big kitchen knife and he'll sit close to the kitchen door, ready to scream and run if anyone arrives. So that's what he's going to do, and now we'll see how his plan works out. When I opened the door, the wind hit me with a shove, a guest banging past me and reeling drunkenly into the house. I had to back my way out, hunching my shoulders against the gale. But when I got around the corner and was on my way up to Shelley's house, I had the wind at my back. The gusts ran at me, turning my light windbreaker into a sail and carrying me along at a trot. A house on the corner was on the market, and as I went by, the real estate agent's metal sign, which was pitching back and forth, snapped free and soared 20 feet before doing the meat cleaver, whack, into the soft dirt of someone's front yard. I did not feel I was walking. <clears throat> I did not feel I was walking to Shelley's house so much as I was being blown there. A fat, warm drop of water splattered the side of my face, just like a mouthful of spit. The wind surged, and a burst of rain, barely a dozen drops, struck the black top ahead of me, producing the smell that is one of the finest odors in the world: the fragrance of hot asphalt in a summer shower. A sound began to build behind me, a thunderous rattle that I could feel in my teeth. It was the sound of a torrential downpour driving into trees and against tar paper roofs and parked cars, a mindless, continuous roar. I picked up my pace, but what was coming couldn't be outrun, and in three more steps it caught me. It came down so hard that the rain bounced when it hit the road, creating a shivering, knee-high billow of spray. Water began to pour into storm drains in a brown, foaming flood. It was amazing how quickly it happened. It seemed like I ran fewer than ten steps before I was splashing ankle deep. A plastic pink flamingo rushed past, carried by the tide. Lightning popped, and the world became an X-ray photograph of itself. I forgot my plan. Did I even have a plan? You couldn't think in a storm like that. I fled through pelting water, cut across the yard of the house next to Shelley's. Only the lawn was melting. It came apart under my heels, long runners of grass, peeling up to reveal the waterlogged earth beneath. I fell, went down on one knee, caught myself with my hands, and came up filthy and wet. I staggered on, across Shelley's driveway, which was a wide and shallow canal by then, and around at the back of the house. I scrabbled at the screen door and leapt inside as if I were on the run from wild dogs. The door banged behind me, only slightly less loud than a crack of thunder, which was when I remembered I'd been aiming for stealth. The kitchen was still and shadowed. My clothes were sopping. I had sat in that kitchen plenty of times in the past, munching Shelley's date cookies and sipping tea, and it had always been a place of pleasant smells and reassuring order. Now, though, there were dirty plates in the sink. The garbage can overflowed, flies crawling on heat paper towels and plastic bottles. I listened, but couldn't hear anything except the rain rumbling on the roof. It sounded like a train going by. The screen door opened behind me and slammed again, and I choked on a scream. I spun, 
ready to drop to my knees and begin begging. But there was no one there, just wind. I pulled the screen door tight, and almost immediately a fresh gust overpowered the old latch and sucked the screen open once more, then thumped it shut. I didn't bother to secure it again. My inside squirmed at the thought of going any farther into the house. I felt strongly that the Phoenician was already there, had heard me coming in, and was patiently waiting for me somewhere in the gloom, down the hall, and around the corner. I opened my mouth to call hello, then thought better of it. What finally got me moving wasn't courage, but manners. A puddle was formed under my feet. I snatched a dish towel and wiped up. It gave me a way to stall going any farther into the house. I liked it close by the screen door, where I could get outside in two steps. Finally, the floor was dry. Uh, finally, the floor. Finally, I lost my place. Finally, the floor was dry. I was still wet, though, and needed a towel myself. I edged over to the doorway and stuck my head around the corner. A dim and lonely hall waited. I crept down the corner, nudging open each door as I came to it, and the Phoenician was in every room. He was in the tiny home office, standing motionless in one corner. I spotted him with my peripheral vision and my pulse did a hectic jig, and I looked again and saw it was only a coat rack. He was in the guest bedroom, too. Oh, at first glance, the place seemed empty. It could have been a room in a Motel 6, with its neatly made queen-sized bed, striped wallpaper, and modest TV. <coughs> the door to the closet, though, was slightly ajar, and as I stared at it, it seemed to wobble slightly as if it had only just been closed. I could feel him in there, holding his breath. It took all the will I possessed to walk the three steps to the closet. When I threw open the door, I was prepared to die. The little cabinet within contained a collection of curious costumes, a pink jumpsuit with a fur collar, white silks of the sort Elvis Presley liked to wear in the 70s, but no psychopaths. <coughs> Finally, only the door to the master bedroom remained. I gently turned the knob and carefully pushed it inward. The screen door in the kitchen chose that exact moment to bang once again, going off like a pistol shot. <laughs> was 
um, had more to it than a short story. But